We're in our series, Going for the Gold. And there's never been an Olympic athlete that hasn't lost before he won. Today we're going to talk about failure. And how we can turn our failures around to have victory. It is a fact. Everyone is going to fail. Matter of fact, turn beside you, the person sitting beside you said, I know that you have failed. Say that to him. <laughs> but say this, I know you're not a failure. You know, because just because we fail doesn't mean that we lose and doesn't mean that we are a failure. Many times the greatest opportunity in front of us is after our biggest failure. This is a fact. Everyone's going to fail. But it is not a fact that everyone's going to learn from their failure. And the people that do not learn from their failures remain negative and dead in their future. Failure is just a temporary inconvenience. We have to look at what failure does. Failure can captivate us from doing things that God wants us to do in the future. We have all failed, but we can't look at ourselves as a failure. Whenever we fail, we need to be reminded that some of the greatest accomplishments of life have been right after we have failed. We've been watching the Olympics this last, anybody watched the Olympics last few days? Opening ceremonies was pretty cool. It was just, a, it was a fun, I love the Olympics, I love the competition. But there's competition with all those athletes, there's only going to be one winner in each competition. Everybody else is going to lose. Would you call those Olympic athletes losers or winners? They're winners. They may not win the gold medal, but they are playing in the Olympics. They are winners. They come back and they are heroes. And sometimes we would look that if we fail one time, that we are not a winner. But God doesn't look at us that way. Today we're going to talk about a character, one of the disciples in the Bible. And his name is Peter. And Peter failed miserably. But he was not a failure. We're going to talk about him and his downward trend. But I want to tell you a story about a man. Let me tell you this story. His name is Walter. He grew up in a very dysfunctional family. Somebody say amen. <laughs> With a dominant, dominant father. He and his three brothers all ran away from home before they were 16 years of age. Walter lied about his age so he could join the army. After the army, Walter started a business at the age of 22 in Kansas City. But he failed and he had to declare bankruptcy. With only $40 to his name, he moved to California to try to become an actor. But he failed. He and his brother Roy started an animation service and he gained rights for the drawing. They didn't gain rights to the drawing, so they lost everything and again filed bankruptcy. Walter suffered from what he described as a heck of a breakdown. But he refused to give up. He had the idea to draw a cartoon mouse. And he would call that mouse Mortimer Mouse. But his wife Lillian said, that's a stupid name. Suggested a better name, which was what? Mickey, Mickey Mouse. M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S-E. -E. That's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> so Mickey was born in 1928. But Walter Disney still faced more failures. After producing several movies and cartoons, his company was $4 million in debt after World War II business was slow. He had a dream to build a theme park in California called Disneyland, but he had no money. Walter was depressed and having a hard time dealing with the stress. He failed again. He took a chance to draw a new medium called television. With Mickey Mouse Club, Davy Crockett, and a wonderful world of color. Turned around. Finally, things turned around for him, and Disneyland opened in 1955. Walt Disney had his dream. Disney World was a swampy area outside of Orlando. And he died at 1966 at the age of 65 before Disney World opened. And today, the Walt Disney Company is worth $75 billion. Was he a failure? Did he fail? He failed. 
His life was in misery many times, but he wasn't going to give up. Today we're going to talk about a character that was miserable. He failed God, but God restored him. He followed him. He denied him. He was restored by him, but he proclaimed him. And four weeks after he was restored, he got up and he preached a message the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 souls were saved and added to the church. That man that was a failure is one of the champions of the Bible. His name is the Apostle Peter. If you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 14. We're going to read a couple sections of this. First one is from 27 to 31. Jesus and his disciples are at the Last Supper. And Jesus said, you will all fall away, Jesus told them. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. But after I have risen, I will go into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. I'll tell you the truth, Jesus answered him. Today, yes, today, before the rooster crows twice, yourself will be disworn me three times. But Peter insistently said, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. Then they left the upper room and walked into the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed while Peter slept. When Jesus was arrested, Peter followed the group back to the house of Caiaphas. And drop down to verse 66 and 72. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When he saw Peter warming himself, she looked in closely at him. You are also one of the Nazarenes, Jesus, he said. But he denied it. I don't know who you are talking about. He said, we went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to him, who standing around, this fellow is one of them. And he denied it again. After a little while, those standing near close to Peter, surely you are one of them. You are a Galilean. He began to call down curses on himself. And he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word of Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Sad story. A man that was their feet just washed by Jesus. A man that walked with him for three years. A man that witnessed tons of people being healed and saved. Denied him. I don't even know who you're talking about. I have a question for you. A question for me. Have you denied Jesus before? When the opportunity arose that you could talk to somebody about Jesus, did you shrink in fear or did you stand up and proclaim? See, we are all just like the disciple. We have all failed God and we've all denied God and we've even denounced Jesus. But just like Peter did, Jesus loved us so much he would never leave us where he was. So I want to talk about the pathway to personal failure. And there's a path that Peter took to his failure. And his first path was, his first downward step was he disagreement with God's word. They said, some say to you, or John the Baptist, Jeremiah, Elijah, and one of the prophets. But Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Jesus said to him, or John, uh, Peter said to him, you are Christ, the son of the living God. You are Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter knew exactly who Jesus was. He knew that he came from heaven. And he saw his power, but yet he still denied him. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 22 through 26, Peter did something that was audacious. He told Jesus he couldn't do something. You ever tell Jesus you can't do it? I don't want to do it. But in Matthew chapter 16, verses 22 through 23, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. Sometimes when we take our own rights and we think the word of God matches ours and we don't agree with what it says, we say, Lord, you're not going to do that. Or no, I'm not going to do that. What we have to do is we have to obey the very words of God. 
When Peter tried to stand up and say, Jesus, you can't do this. He did not understand what Jesus was about ready to do was something that nobody else could ever do. He was going to redeem every soul that has ever lived back to Christ. It was what Jesus did. It's not what the church did. It's what Jesus did. Jesus was about ready to die so we have access to heaven. And Peter said, no! You can't do it. And Jesus looked over to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. And there's times in our lives that we listen to the voice of Satan instead of listening to the voice of God. And sometimes God has to tell us, get behind me, Satan. Learn the very words of God. So what do you do with the word of God? First, you have to read it. Then you have to believe it. But the hardest part of that is obey it. There's a lot of times that we know the word of God. We read the word of God. We understand the word of God. But the hardest part about being a Christian is obeying it. It'd be easy if we could just read it. But obeying it means I have to do some things that maybe I do not want to do. Peter said, it's not going to happen to you. And Jesus had to say something to his first disciple. Don't listen to Satan. Listen to me. Because what I'm about ready to do is going to change the world. What I'm about ready to do is going to change your future. So that was the first. He didn't listen to the word of God. The second is Peter's second step forward failure is overconfidence. Sometimes our biggest failure is because we have too much confidence and we think we can do things ourselves. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, it says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Peter said, not me. I, even if I have to die, I will not denounce you. And just that same night, he denied him three times. How could one time say, I could stand up for God. But in that very same night, because of fear of people, he denied him three times. When he heard that rooster crow, he remembered exactly what he said. Not me. I will never denounce you. And that rooster crowed. And the Bible says in the book of Luke that he looked at Jesus and that blood-stained face of Jesus. The eyes were bloody and his hair was bloody and he was beaten. And Jesus looked over at Peter and Peter looked at Jesus and he remembered. That's who I'm supposed to serve. That's what it's all about. And he went out and wept bitterly. He understood that pride captivated him. I would never do that. And for anybody to say, I will never sin, or I would never do something, we have to remember that we are very weak individuals. And what we need is we need the power of God within our life. We need to get rid of the pride of our arrogance and say, I need the humility of Christ. Pride is a condition that blinds the person who has it. Everybody else can see it. But sometimes when we are pride about something or prideful about something, we just do not understand what's going on. Peter set himself and warmed the fire by people that did not love Christ. He was so prideful, he thought he could stand in the midst of those that mocked, beat, and crucified Jesus, and it would not affect him. But it did. Mark chapter 14, verse 54 says that Peter followed Jesus at a distance to the courtyard of Caiaphas' house. Sometimes Christians... Sometimes that's our biggest weakness. We want to follow Christ, but we don't want to be like Christ. We want to know about Christ, but we don't want to sit with the people of Christ. We want to watch from a distance, as Peter did. But what happens when you watch Jesus and you follow Jesus from a distance? We start doing things that we shouldn't do. There's a step that is found in Psalms chapter 1. I love the book of Psalms. But there's a downward trend that Peter took that we take if we do not follow Christ. It's found in Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Blessed is the who, walk, who does not walk, blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked, or stand in the way of the sinner, or sit in the company of the mockers. There's three steps. If you walk with the wrong crowd, you're going to stand with them. And sooner or later, you'll sit 
with them. And at the end, you'll be with them. If we find ourselves walking with the wrong crowd, doing the wrong thing, we have to say, no, I've got to turn, I've got to stop, I've got to move. Peter took these steps and they hurt him. So how do we take these steps? When that servant girl said, I recognize you. Weren't you one of the Galileans? I've never known you. And he cursed them. He said, I can't say the words he probably said in church, but could you imagine what he said? He was a sailor. Have you ever been around a sailor? Okay, Peter was a sailor, and he cussed like a sailor at this time, so we can just go with that. It was not good. He cussed, he denied, and he cried. When we have denied Christ, what do we do? That downward trend was overbearing for him. So what do you do with that? The third step on that pathway of failure is peer pressure from the wrong crowd. When we're walking with the wrong crowd, we have the peer pressure. And just like Peter, we can't stand up. Early on, when I was early in my ministry, I was a youth pastor. And I remember the very first funeral that I had to preach. And Johnny has a funeral. Where's Johnny at? Johnny has a funeral this Friday with a good friend of his as a race car driver. And he's uh, doing that funeral. So we need to pray for Johnny for this Friday. Okay? It's very difficult to do. And I had a funeral. And I failed at this funeral. My very first funeral. The guy, uh, he didn't come to church at all. Didn't know Christ. And for some reason, they asked me to do the funeral. And as a novice preacher, <laughs> I said, okay. But I stood in front of a bunch of people, and I was too scared to tell them that they needed to have Jesus. I was trying to tickle their ears and let them like me as a preacher. I learned a lesson that day when I walked up away from that pulpit. I said to myself, never again, never again will I stand behind the pulpit of Jesus and not proclaim his name. I have no idea who was in that room, whether they were believers or non-believers. It makes no difference as a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have one mandate, and that's to proclaim the name of Jesus. Not to be ashamed and not to be afraid but the truth is the word of God. And so times we care so much about the people around us that we lose the fact what Jesus has called us to do. Peter took these three steps. Disagreement with God's word. Overconfidence. And the peer pressure that was around him. And when we are so captivated by that peer pressure, we lose what God wants us to do. But Peter denied Christ. And he hit rock bottom. The difference between Judas... And Peter was this. Judas took the money and he threw it back at Caiaphas. And he went out and hung himself. The difference between Judas and Peter was Peter went to his knees and he cried out for forgiveness. And he went back with his disciples. He went for restoration. And that is so important. Either we can run in our failures and become a failure or we can take our failure and get right with God and say, I need help and I can be restored. So what is the pathway to personal restoration? If you're a human creature, you're going to make mistakes. I made mistakes this morning. I make mistakes every day. But I can't be so captivated by my mistakes, I can't let God do things within my life. So what are the first steps? The first one is admit. Admit you're a failure. As soon as the rooster crowed and Jesus' eyes caught on Peter's eyes, Peter looked down and he knew he failed him. He knew he denied him. He remembered what Jesus would say. Even tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you have denied me three times. Right in front of everyone, in front of those that hated Jesus, the Bible said that Peter wept bitterly. He admitted his faults. When it comes to failure and sin in your life, you have two options. Your first option, 
the option many of us take, you can hide it. You can mask it. You can be a hypocrite. Not me. Or you can admit it and let God work with it. So often in our failures, our mistakes, and our sins, we are too ashamed of what we've done. So we try to mask our sin. That's why, kind of what Peter was trying to do. He wanted to follow Christ, but he was afraid that people would see him. So when he failed Christ, it was only when Jesus, his mind came back to him. And he remembered what Jesus said to him. And he saw the Lord. He wept bitterly. Let me throw this application out to you. We all have sin. And when you come to church, because your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your wife, or your mom, or your dad make you come to church, and the preacher's up preaching, and he hits something that's a core to you, it's a spark to you, and you know it's a sin in your life, and the Holy Spirit of God is now prompting you to do something. Either you can hide from that sin, or you can do what Peter did. And obey Jesus. And confess that sin. And when you confess that sin. What that means is I'm going to admit. I was wrong. And we've all been wrong. You're not better than me. And I'm not better than you. We are all failures. But because we have been saved. We are victorious in our life. We're not stuck into our failure. Someone said to err is human. And that is true. And to cover it up is human also. We all want to be seen differently than what we truly are. But the way that Jesus sees us, without our hypocrisy, without our life, without our failures, Jesus looks at us. And let me tell you, when Jesus died on the cross and he shed his blood for your sins, you know what Jesus sees in you? You know what God sees in you? We see our failures. We see our insecurities. But Jesus looks at us. He doesn't see the sin that you have committed. When we give our life to Christ, God looks down and he sees his son. The one that you've asked forgiveness from. God does not look at your sin. God looks at his son. And because of his son, he looks at you as his son. But what if when Peter says, no Lord, it will never be done. I will never allow them to crucify you. What if Peter would have kept Jesus from the cross? That would have changed humanity. But Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So I want to give you a challenge. In your sin, sometimes we have to be bold. Admit it. Face up to it. And say it. No longer will you captivate my life. I was a failure in this. But I'm going to have victory in this. So if there's something in your life, whether it's cigarettes or smoking or drinking or you're not in California, Colorado, maybe pot, whatever it is, face it. Claim it. Look at it face to face and say, get behind me, Satan. You know, Jesus does not want us to sin. And Jesus does not wink at our sin. Satan wants you to sin. Satan wants to entice you with sin. But Jesus says, no way, I died for that sin. But the greatest thing about a child of God, when God looks at us, he sees his son, the sacrifice that his son has given to us. The second to have re restoration is repent of your sin. That's a new word for some of us. What's repent mean? Stop it. Turn from it. Walk away from it. Do not be enticed by it any longer. Don't walk with it. Don't sit beside it. Don't play with it. Repent means I am done with it. Repent means this. Get behind me, Satan. Well, nobody's really going to know. It's not going to hurt anybody. Get behind me, Satan. It does never any, it does not do it's any good to hint with our sins and to play with our sin and not do what God has called us to do. You have your sin and I have mine. But what we must do is admit what our sin truly is and repent from it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, the Bible says, Godly sorrow brings repentance 
that leads to salvation, that leads no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Godly sorrow brings repentance and brings life. So the third downward step is to serve, the, the third step towards repentance is to serve, God's, to serve God with his people. Do you know the difference between what God wants us to do and what we want to do? Is God has enabled us to do his things. He wants us to do great things for him. Jesus not only predicted Peter would deny him, he also predicted that he would come back to him. In Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 32, Jesus said, Simon, Simon. Now put your name in there, because it could be there as well. Bruce, Bruce. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Satan has asked for you. Have you ever had a time where you know there was an oppression on you? Satan was working within your life. Maybe it was through depression or anxieties. And you knew that something just wasn't right. There's such a thing called oppression. The oppression of Satan upon your life. But let me give you this straight. There's also a word called possession. Where Satan, where you could be possessed. But once Jesus has taken up residency within your life, Satan can never possess you. He can never take over your life because Jesus is already in your life. But there is an oppression. Satan is asked to sift you like wheat. In other words, to try you, to tempt you. And he said, when you fall away and come back, strengthen your brothers. Well, that tells me what we need to do as a church. We've all been sifted. We've all been trialed. And we all, in some area, have turned away and have changed our hearts and failed God. But what the Bible says that Jesus told Peter, but when you come back, strengthen your brothers. That means, I've said this a million times, where you have failed, strengthen somebody that's walking down that same path. When somebody is walking away from you, and you know that person needs you. Don't be ashamed of your failure. Use your failure to encourage others. Use your insecurities to lift up other people's insecurities. The body of Christ should be united in doing one thing. And that's proclaiming the message of Jesus. Satan wants to sift you like wheat. He wants to do that to us. He wants to do that to the church. Satan hates the body of Christ. Let me tell you this, Satan hates you. Satan wants you to goof up. Satan wants you to make a mistake. But when we make those mistakes, we have to realize just what Peter did. He looked at Jesus face to face and he wept bitterly because he knew he was wrong. In John chapter 21, the final restoration place for Jesus and Peter, the disciples left following Christ. He was dead. He, they didn't know what was taking place. So they went back to their boats. And they started fishing. And when they came back to the shore, they were about 100 yards off the shore. They saw a man on the shore making a fire. And the man yelled out to him, how's the fishing going? And John said, we haven't caught anything. And he said, throw your nets on the other side. And that should have caught attention because they did this just a few chapters before. So John said, okay. So they threw their nets on the other side and a great catch was made. And then John looked up the shore and he said, who is this man? And they realized it was Jesus. Peter realized it was Jesus. And Peter did the Forrest Gump before Forrest Gump. He jumped in that water and he swam to Lieutenant Dan. And Lieutenant Dan is now Jesus. And he looked over and just like Forrest Gump, that's my boat. Jesus did something to Peter that he needs to do with us. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. In John chapter 21, Jesus sitting by a fire with Peter. This time the fire is not the fire that was going to deny him. This is going to be the fire to restore him. And Jesus looked, do you love me? 
Peter looked down and he said, you know I love you, but I fail you. Jesus looked at him again. He said, do you love me? He said, I want to. I don't want to fail you. And he asked him a third time. He said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter, with humility, instead of arrogance, said, yes, Lord, I love you. And Jesus says, go feed my sheep. Go feed my sheep. In other words, go do something that was great. Four weeks, four weeks after this restoration, Peter stood up with all confidence in Christ and not confidence in himself, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. He proclaimed the message of Jesus and 3,000 people gave their life to Christ. He would have never been able to proclaim that message of Jesus in his own power. But because of his failure, he was restored. Because of your failure, you can be restored. Because of your failure, Jesus can start using you. Some of the greatest things that have ever taken place in our life is not because we failed, it's what we learned when we fail. We pick something up, we learn, and we grow. That is what it's all about. You know I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. But back in the old days, they used to win the Super Bowls. <laughs> Hasn't happened in a while. They used to win the Super Bowl because of one main in man. His, his name was Emmett Smith. He held a, the rushing record of 18,355 yards. He carried the ball over 4,400 times. He scored over 400 touchdowns. But that means he was tackled 4,000 times. He's a Hall of Famer. He was tackled for... Why can't you score every time? He was tackled. Was he a failure? No. Now the Cowboys are, but he wasn't. They used to win because of persistence. Whether it's three yards, get back up, three yards, get back up, three yards, get back up. You can march down the field and you can win. Or you can roll over and say, I can't do it. See, John Maxwell says this. Failing doesn't mean I'm a failure. It just means I haven't succeeded yet. It doesn't mean I've accomplished nothing. It means I've learned something. It doesn't mean I'll never make it. It just means I have a reason to start over again. It doesn't mean God has abandoned me. It just means he has a better plan for me. See, sometimes in our arrogance, in our pride, we don't need God. I'm good. I'll call on you when I do need you. And Jesus says he cannot give grace to the pride. The Bible even said he resists the pride and gives grace to the humble. But when God does this for you, when you fail, just like the disciple, he fell on his knees and wept bitterly because of his failure. Jesus went to him and he restored him. Failure isn't final. Failure can be a new start. What we have to do is we have to look at what our failures are and admit my mistakes and allow Christ to do something for us. I go back to the scripture and Jesus was about ready to go to the cross and, si and Peter says, no, no, I don't want you to go. And that would have been the greatest failure of Peter's life until this moment. This moment when he was restored, he stood up and said, I need Christ. I need what Christ can do for me. And he proclaimed the message. Remember in the old days, I don't even know if this church used to have, and they used to have altars across the front called prayer altars or morning benches if you would. And at the end of a service, there would be people coming down, flooding the aisles, and praying during the, at these benches. At our church, we use the steps. I think we should probably go back to the altars. But what they did is this. They admitted 
they have failed. They admit that they need Christ. Either you can hide from it or you can admit it. But God cannot give you grace until you follow it. Just like the disciple. He admitted. He denied Christ. Sometimes we have to look Satan face to face. And I want you to know. With God. Not with yourself. But with God. You have power over Satan. You have power over your sin. You have the ability with God to defeat anything that's tripping you up. With God. Without God, you will never win. But with God's power and with God's grace, you can face your sin. You can face your fear. And let's say it together. Get behind me, Satan. Until we have the gumption within our soul to say, I have failed. And I am not going to fail again. Remember that sermon I told you I preached at that first funeral? I was afraid, so I didn't talk about Jesus. About three years ago, there was a person that died, and I was a pastor of this church. And they said, we don't want any of that church stuff at the sermon. I said, we'll get you another preacher. Because I cannot and I will not ever get behind the pulpit of Jesus Christ and never proclaim that Jesus is the only way to heaven. And as a child of God, when we deny Christ, we need to learn from it. We should never, ever admit that we can do anything on our own. But with Christ, we can do all things. Because of his strength and not my strength. Those altars need to be full. Because we all fail Christ. We all have pride. I've been a preacher for a long time. As you can tell, I used to be black-headed when I came to pastor here. Now I'm all gray-headed and fat, but other than that, it's all good. I have my own insecurities, but that's okay. Um, I've, I've talked to a lot of people. They come to the altar, and I'm not a Catholic priest by any means, but something about people coming to the, in my office, and they confess their sin. I go, whoo, close my ears. But you know what? There's never been a person that came in my, in my office and said, Bruce, I suffer from the sin of pride. Nobody. And see, that's what keeps us at the altar. Knowing that we need Christ. What keeps us in the seat is our sin of our pride. Sin of our arrogance and overconfidence. And that's why Peter failed. Do you want to have victory in your life? Admit your sin. Repent from it. And follow after Christ. You're the only one that can change your life. You have failed. And I have failed. What did you learn from that failure? And as Satan has sifted you, he's tried you, he's tempted you. And when you have failed, get up. Look to him face to face in his eye and say, Get behind me, Satan. It will never happen again. And stand up with confidence. Just like Peter did. And three or four weeks after that, he stood up and proclaimed the message with the power of the Holy Spirit. You want to have that strength? You want to have that power? Do you want to have the power that you can do all things through Christ? You first have to get that power on your knees. Repent of your sin. Repent of your failure. And look at that and say, I will never fail again. And you might. Get on your knees again. You don't quit smoking the same day. You don't quit drinking the same day. You don't have victory the same day. You fight it and fight it and fight it and fight it and fight it until one day you have victory over it. Don't just try one time and quit. It's a daily battle. The Bible says die to yourself daily. That means everything that you go, you need God's power on a daily basis. That's how you have victory. That's how you can win. Deny yourself. Take up the cross and follow me. Will you please stand to your feet? Just like Peter had to do. He had to admit it. He looked in the gaze of the eyes of Jesus. And he knew that he needed Christ. He knew about him. But he denied him. 
We know about Christ. But do we deny him? Do we have sin? We need to ask God to forgive us and to restore us and to have purpose and victory within our lives. Dear Father, Lord, be with us.